Hello and welcome to Facebook Live. We're here at Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. And today is a very special day because we're doing a live chat with Professor Patrick McGorry. Um, we've got the next hour booked in and we've gotten a bunch of your questions here that we're going to ask Pat. And you can also type in online in the feed and we'll be going through looking at what people are asking, choosing there's a lot of, there's, we've got a lot of questions to get through, but we'll be choosing some of them to ask Pat today. Um, just as a bit of an intro, I'm SJ. I work here at Origin. I ac actually was one of the first members of the Youth Advisory Council three years ago. I remember, I remember getting a selfie with you three years ago. I was very, very nervous. Um, and when I'm not here, I also work online under Honor Eastley doing a bunch of mental health advocacy work. Um, so the reason why we're here today is because 25, uh, Origin turns 25 this year, which is a big milestone. Um, and we wanted to get questions from people all over the country to ask Pat so we can have a bit more of a conversation around what's the future for youth mental health in Australia and also in the world. Um, as we'll be talking, before we get started, as we'll be talking a bit about probably some heavy topics um, I just wanted to flag that there'll be some resources that you can access in terms of places to call or places that you can chat online and those will be linked to in the live feed on this so you can just find them there. They'll be linked to a couple of times while, we, while we're talking. Cool. All right. Are you ready, Pat? I'm ready. You're time. ready? I'm ready to go. This, Australia's got questions for you. That's great. It's great <laughs> that they're interested. It's really great. So I wanted to first talk about what a big year it is. So it's, we're at year 25 of, yeah. of Origin in existence. <clears throat> and um, Origin has had a really big impact on youth mental health in Australia, but also globally. And I just wanted to ask you, what does it feel like to reach a milestone like this? Well, in, in one way it's really great, but in another way it's frustrating that we've still got a long way to go. I, I guess we made a lot of progress, like you said, and, started off 25 years ago really with early intervention as an idea and, mm -hmm. and we realised that it was mainly a, a, a young people's issue actually because of all the mental health problems emerging in young people. We started off with um, psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia but we really quickly realised that it was a much bigger issue here, you know, the mental health of young people more generally and their families and and um, yeah, so it's <coughs> it seems to have gone pretty quickly that 25 years, I've got to yeah. say. But um, you know, it's really the next 25 we're really um, energised about, I, I guess, now these days. So the work is not done. Oh, no, no, but, but we, we, it is a thing, you know. It, like you said, um, youth mental health, early intervention, that they weren't part of the conversation 25 mm. years ago. And now they really, really are. And that's why I suppose the interest today is so great that people want to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. But do you ever like give yourself a pat on the back? Are you ever like, yes, you know, we've done a lot of stuff here. Yeah, well, that's because we've, we've treated it like a team effort, mm. you know. We've all, um, we've realised we've got, we need everyone's support for this, you know. We need some talent, we need a mm. talented team and um, we've got to work with people all around the world to make this a, a change, you know, because if you're going to change things, it needs, you know, the early adopters, the innovators, all working together and defeating the, the inertia, the status quo, and, and, and overcoming all the resistance to the change. Yeah, you're definitely right. <coughs> one thing that I wanted to chat to you about is that one thing that's really changed in the last 25 years is our, our public attitude to mental health and mm. youth mental health. I know that when I was in high school, which is a little while ago now, I, was, I remember being told when I was like 15 that if I was going to die before I was 25, it would be in a road accident. Mm. And once I got older, and particularly once I started working in mental health, I really realized that that wasn't true, that suicide is, is, is tw like twice as likely an outcome mm. as, as road accidents. Yeah. I was curious as to how do you think the public perception of mental health has changed over the last 25 years? Um, and how the <coughs> messaging and edu education has changed. Well, I guess people have started to realise it's, it's, it's everyone's business, you know, mm. it's going to affect all of our lives, like half of the population are going to have mental health problems at some point, and that means every family is going to be affected. So 
that's partly why they've taken it more seriously. It's not it's not really an altruistic thing. I don't think it's partly that, but it's it's also wow. This could this could be me. This could be you know my family. And um, as you say, you know, suicide was swept under the carpet, and, and there's still mm. a tendency to do that even today. You know, to get very nervous about talking about suicide, and we're probably going to touch on that. Mm. But but um, really, there's no issue that benefits from being hushed up. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we now know, you know, people didn't realise how many people were dying. You know? and, and like you said, just like road accidents, these deaths are not inevitable. They can be prevented. And, um, you know, these, the people that die do not have terminal illnesses like cancer or something like that. If, if they're actually supported in the right way, then they will survive. And if, if, if you prevent, you know, if you wear your seatbelts, you know, mm. if you don't drink and drive, all that kind of stuff, you won't die in a road accident, most mm. likely. Yeah, that's a. You're totally right that the the attitudes have really shifted a lot. One thing that I'm curious to get your thoughts on is this idea that um, young people these days are, are less resilient. Is that something that you mm. deal with in your work? Because I I've heard people be like, "Is that true? Is that not true?" Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's. I really think this resilience idea is is a is a bit of a trap. You know? mm. Um, people think that they can teach people how to be resilient and I don't think there's much evidence for that actually. It's, it's almost like a after the fact decision, you know, if you didn't have a breakdown, if you didn't, you know, mm. have a bad outcome then you must have been resilient. Well, you might have been luck, you know. Mm. I don't think it's, and, and that means the people who do have issues and problems are, are sort of labelled as not resilient. Mm. Yeah, 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 And yeah. they're kind of blamed for having the problem and, and that's incredibly it's victim blaming in a way. This, you know, that it's a, that's a real trap of this resilience concept, and definitely when it's applied to a whole generation, that's so unfair. You know, and and uh, you know, just to give you an, an, another example, which you'd know from your work with a youth advisory group, some of the most resilient people in the world are people that have had mental health problems. Mm. So they've had a lot more to deal with than the average person. I mean, you see that other people have had a, a dream life, no no problems, and, and and they don't really have any resilience because they've never been tested. Yeah. Well, you know, you could spend 30, 40 years doing that, and that's a very, you know, val valuable thing to do. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people it suits them, you know, to do that sort of work. It's great, but the mental illness, the mental health area, um, was like a greenfield. You know, the, the, it was mm. so much opportunity to do, to change things and make things better. Whereas probably things were going to progress pretty well, you know, in a way without me in, in diabetes land. You know, but I thought I could do something in mental health. I, I really wanted to. And it, there's also this fascination, you know, with, with especially with things like psychosis, you know, mm. like it's such a strange alteration of experience that to try to understand that and, 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 and to try to relieve the suffering that goes with it, that was very attractive. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting to hear that you were interested in mental health because there was kind of so much opportunity for it to be better. Mm. And, and there still is. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's still a lot of opportunity for that. Um, 
one thing that uh, people, it's, it's interesting to hear about it, that you're interested in change and now coming to where you are, you've, you've seen a lot of change, you've seen governments come and go, systems be put in place and then reformed. Um, one thing that a lot of people were really curious to hear about from you, and we've got, this is a question basically from Max, Graham and Alice. <laughs> they were all yeah. really asking, mm. how do you keep at it without tearing your hair out about how slow system change can be? Yeah, well, I do find it frustrating, the, 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 the slow rate of change. Yeah, that is, that's definitely <coughs> um, a feeling that I've had. But um, I don't know. I mean, you, you just, you know, I, I still work, you know, like clinically in Headspace and Origin and, and other, other places. And, and, and when you see what, what um, is happening to people in the real world and, and they're not getting a fair, fair go, and, and yet when we do work with people, mostly they, they are... It's, it's, it's very beneficial for them and you know um, it's very motivating actually um, mm. and, and the young people like you know the role that you've had with us you know being able to work with you and, and we're working together on the same thing it, it's it's very motivating I, I've never really burned out you know because of really no. no no it's because of because of uh, what you said and um, and it, you know, we're lucky. We've got the chance to, to make a real difference. You know, people can work their whole lives and not feel that they've mm. had the chance to do anything. You know, people need meaning, and uh, it's given me a lot of meaning in, 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 in you know my life to actually have been lucky enough to work in the way that I have. And it is frustrating because pace is still too slow. Mm. You know, we've we've got all this evidence. You know, we've used evidence and, and research as a way of learning what what we should be doing. And even when we've got the evidence, we find that there's resistance to ac um, actually investing in it and, yeah. and making the change. So, but then I suppose it's the power of the people. Then, isn't it? It's like the social movement. Um, we've got to mobilise the, the public, you know, and, and the young people to help us make these changes, or even be even to lead these changes. And we support. Mm. Yeah, you're so right about the public conversation. That that's so integral to getting political movement. Yeah, the, the po politicians are very sensitive to what the public think. Yeah, I was. It's, I think that's interesting that you are involved in this really high level stuff, you know, around system change. But at the same time, you're also, you know, you still work in services. That's the best bit. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Why is that better? Well, it's 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 really what I was trained to do, and, mm. and what what I you know, you see the benefit, you see immediate results almost not immediate but you see things get getting better you know in the person uh, with the person and and um so that's the best thing but i mean and, and you've got to remember like it's only really only the last 10 years or so that i really got anywhere politically you know in, um being able to sort of talk to politicians in a, in a more accessible way you know that took a long time i was in my mid to late 50s by the time i got to do that yeah wow yeah that is actually a good point i think that it's interesting when we hear about people who are involved in kind of wider system change. It's it's interesting to hear about how long it takes to to get anywhere. Mm, mm. Well, see, someone like me, it wouldn't be true. There's lots of young people that actually have got more political influence in a way at a younger age than I did. But I, I spent the first it's probably times about forty just training as a as a as a as a specialist in medicine, training as a researcher, getting my PhD. And getting to the point where I could actually do something, you know, mm. it, I was probably forty by the time I got to that point. I was, I was yeah. just building skills and, and, and knowledge and uh, confidence. I say, I'd, I'd say, too, because I wasn't a confident person when I was younger in, in, in that sense. So, and then you know, it took another probably ten years of us developing with our whole team here what 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 we thought we, we should be doing, you know, mm. like getting the evidence and the, the, the kind of model right. And keeping evolving it, and and I suppose so. It's it's a whole process, and it's a, like I said before, it's a team game. You've got to have star players and lots of different positions to be, you know, winning the game too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, you're making me feel impatient because yeah. I'm like not even thirty, and I'm like, why is more stuff not happening? Yeah, when well you've got heaps of time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got ages. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Headspace. So, obviously, Headspace is kind of. Um, you know, was spearheaded by Origin. Um, and now there's over 110 centres across Australia. Mm. Um, it's been uh, copied in other countries. 
but I'm just curious about how something like that starts. Like, what are the most important okay. things that make something like that happen? Well, maybe I can just uh, <coughs> explain how it really happened. You know? Sure. Because um, we had been working, as I said, focusing on early intervention for psychosis, you know, schizophrenia, for the first few years of, you know, in the 90s, you know. And, and then we realised we had to do youth mental health because it was, you know, lots of other problems like anorexia and personality disorders and substance use and depression and all sorts of other things. So it's a broaden. But, but then we, we looked at the results of national mental health surveys and we, we realised that in our part of Melbourne where we work uh, as Origin, you know, where we're, we're working, um, there were maybe a, a million people and, mm. and 200,000 young people. And if you look at the survey data, 50,000 50, of those young people had a mental health problem in any given year, so about a quarter in our age group, mm. like the 12 to 25s. Um, and guess how many we were seeing at, at Origin in those days? Like can eight, I... Eight, can have a guess, yeah. Well, you, you said eight, so... 800. 800, oh my gosh, okay. Eight, 800 out, out of 50,000. Wow. So, so how are we going to deal with that? I mean... Either you give them all self-help group uh, books mm. or something, or you try to develop a primary care platform, you know, mm. like um, which would be a high volume, you know, like so lots more young people could, could get in, even if it was for a briefer period or for less intensive sort of care and help. But that was kind of missing because young people, generally speaking, didn't see the, your standard general practitioner as, as yeah. the place to go, and so they really weren't accessing care, or, or if they were, as a bit hit and miss and. And the vast majority of them, you know, like three quarters of them were getting no help whatsoever. And so we had to build something like a platform of care that could link with Origin and other specialist services. But there was a huge hole in the, in the, in the, in the ladder, in the step ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there still is, actually. I mean, we've built a, a couple of extra rungs with Headspace, but there's still a few more rungs that go. are missing. Yeah. But that's, that's what we did. And we, we, we actually told every member of parliament how many young people in each of their electorates... Um, were in need of care and, and they knew this was true because the parents were coming in and telling them and and, and um, so we managed to get both sides of politics in the 2004 election to commit to yeah. something like Headspace and, and then the coalition got in and they started and later on Labor kept expanding it so it's been a big success because of the, the public support really. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting to talk about that public support and also the the political support, financial support. Um, people can often say that we're we're investing all of this money in youth mental health, and still some of the key indicators aren't aren't improving. Aren't improving, you yeah. know, like the the suicide rate isn't going down, the rate of mental health issues isn't going down. Um, why do, you, why do you think that is? Well, if you look at the scale of the problem, I mean, with Headspace, even with 100 centres, um, there's a couple of things to say about that. Um, that probably treats like maybe 100,000 young people a year. We know there's a million young people a year that need care. Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's still not complete access. It's still a, a, the majority of young people still are probably not getting even that access. But it's, it, look, it's a, great, it's a great base camp and first step. Um, and then, as I say, 40% of the young people coming into Headspace have got more po complex problems. And there's really very few places they can go after mm -hmm. Headspace. They're kind of stuck. They, they get in the front door, but there's no other um, shelves in the supermarket. You know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to mix the metaphors a bit. <laughs> but, but so we've only half, well, not even half, we've only started to build the system of care for young people. So, of course, there's still going to be heaps of young people that that still need, need help. We're not doing much in prevention. We're not necessarily tackling the drivers of this mental Ill health in young people like bullying, um, mm. other forms of abuse, drug and alcohol, other sorts of risk factors that need to be tackled as well if you want to turn off the tap. And um, there are structural things in society like the casualization of the workforce yeah. and all this kind of stuff that is also making the mental health of young people worse. And, and um, you know, so probably even though we're, we're, st we're stemming the tide a bit, the tide is getting higher. You, you brought up the missing middle, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a whole bunch of people that, you know, are, are too sick for, let's say, primary care like Headspace. Too, too, um, uh, their needs are too complex, mm. but they can't get into the more specialised care, that, that, that which is like emergency departments or, you know, acute hospitals. There's a whole bunch of people in the middle there. That, mm. and, and why is that? Well, 
the basic reason is because we're not spending any money on it. Mm. Uh, and um, you know, mental illness causes nearly 15% of the health burden in any given year, and the government spends around 5% of the total health budget on it. So it's about a third of what needs to be spent. Yeah. So imagine if you did that in cancer and, and, and uh, you were turning away, you know, a whole bunch of people with, you know, m mid-stage cancer or early-stage cancer, which is potentially very serious, and, mm. and, uh, and you're only treating the people in life-threatening situations or palliative care. That's really been the situation in mental illness generally. Yeah. And I think that one thing, because I've, you know, I feel like I've been in that missing middle yeah, section right. yeah. myself, and... Um, I think one of the really unfortunate byproducts that comes from that is that it, it can be really like it can be really traumatic actually mm. to be mm. in a system where you you are like asking for help but kind you of dismissed it. or like mm. you can't really get access to the things that you feel like you need until it gets to a really critical point mm. in time. Yeah, well, you've been you've been through it. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about how do we, you know, the system at the moment is imperfect, and we know that there's all like we've talked about how there was this kind of hole in the beginning in primary care, mm. and now there's kind of this hole sort of just after that. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I'm passionate about is how do we sort of like how do we try and let people know that they're not a problem themselves if they're struggling in this mm. system to get help. It's like a, it's like a human rights issue in, mm. in many ways, I think. You know? um, uh, and it's also often the same people, like, you know, if you've, if you've got, let's say, and I've heard people talk about this as patients, you know, um, you know when I had cancer, I, I got really fantastic care. I had a lymphoma and, you know, I got the chemotherapy that I needed and I, I recovered and I'm in remission, I'm cured. Know, and then the same person will describe that their experience as having a mental health problem in the same health system, mm -hmm. and they got treated completely differently. Mm. And, and um, so it's like structural stigma is the term we use for it, and, mm. uh, and it's um, it's justified. It's um, and you know um, I heard someone talking last week about the, the federal budget, and you know the current health minister is very supportive of mental health. Greg Hunt, he's he's mm. doing I think everything he can with the current constraints, you know, on, on funding, but. You know, you've got to say when the health budget came out, there were B words in front of cancer and M words in front of mental mental illness, and and um, that's not his fault. It's a hard thing to turn around quickly, but we need to have the B words, the billions, not the millions. And yeah, you just look at the N NDIS for example. Um, Four hundred thousand people with, with serious physical illnesses uh, or disabilities, um, and that's costing twenty two billion dollars mm. a year. We've got four million Australians with mental illness. And we're spending 9.6 billion on it. So huge underinvestment, and that causes all sorts of problems. Um, not just access and, and making people feel like they don't deserve help, but the quality of care. Mm. When when you get care, it's not that good a lot of the mm. time, mm. and it's and, and people are in the position that the clinicians are sort of forced to make these Sophie's choices about who gets help and who doesn't, and even blaming people for seeking help. Come back when you when you're really serious. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. All yeah. that kind of stuff. It makes people behave in ways they they, sh they they wouldn't like to see themselves behaving in, actually. And, and this is why people burn out in these jobs, because they know that they, they're doing the wrong thing or they can't do the right thing, and um, it's unsustainable. So underinvestment is such a toxic thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it has, su it has such um, bad, as you said, it has such bad consequences for people working in the system and then also for, for people everybody. on both sides. In fact, you know, as, a, as an English psychiatrist, um, once described the neglect of adolescent mental health as a, as a form of self-harm that the society inflicts mm. on itself. You know? So it's at every level. It's the individual level, the family level, the, the society, the productivity of the economy, everything. You know? it's, it's just such a dumb thing to, to be neglecting. Yeah, and it has such big like, long-term flow-on effects. Yeah. So we made a lot of, pro come back to your earlier points, not to get too depressed about this. <laughs> you know? We made a lot of progress. And we know what to do. We really know what to do. These community-based, stigma-free platforms like Headspace could be built on and expanded greatly. Um, and they could be developed for other stages of life. We know what to do, but we're doing dumb things like putting more and more money into emergency departments and the bottom end of the, of the, of the, of the system, uh, the, the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. Yeah. That's what we kind of try to catch up, but we're not, not being very smart about it.
Yeah, well, yeah, you're getting people at the at the end yeah. when, when... It's like in cancer, if you said, right, we've really got to beat cancer. Let's put all our money into palliative care. And, and once we've done that, then we'll think about, you know, trying to intervene early. Mm. Well, that's the way we're still thinking about mental illness generally. It's interesting you ask, you mentioned particularly emergency departments because uh, someone, on, someone on Facebook was asking about, like, hospital alternatives. Yeah. And I was interested in that in Victoria, and I'm pretty sure in New South Wales we have prevention and recovery centres. Yep. Um, I used to work mm. alongside one oh, that was a, yeah. a youth one. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think that those are good options is my first question. And, and I'm also interested to, to ask, kind of like, how do you think you can get more funding for approaches like that? Well, the, the, to, just to pat the government on the head a little bit, the state government just announced a, a youth park for this region where Oregon oh, is, really? so that's great. And, and the good thing about that is that it's like a more therapeutic, you know, um, more patient type of mm. way of helping people in, their, in a more acute or, or, or more, more complex phases of illness. Because the, the hospital system is, is very, um, I don't know, short term, uh, containment, you know, risk management, all that kind of stuff. It's not very therapeutic most of the time these days, unfortunately. So we do need a much more caring, supportive environment um, like that. But even, even more so, we need alternatives to hospitalisation that we used to have a lot more of, like home-based treatment. Back in the 90s, mm. when we first started with Epic and Origin, we had very dynamic home-based treatment teams that would um, head people off at the pass. As soon as mm. someone was referred, you'd go to their home, you'd, you'd, you'd talk to the parents and, and the young person, and you'd work out what you could do to support them in getting better in their home environment, which is much, much less threatening than being brought into mm. hospital, you know, often with ambulances and police mm. and all that kind of stuff. You know, we could do that with, for a large number of patients. And, and these services have just withered away on the, on the vine, you know, in, in, in the last decade or so. So we, we're not doing the things that work even. We're, we're, we're mindlessly putting more and more money into emergency departments, thinking yeah. that's the way to, you know, sort of, um, what's the word, buy our way out of the, out of the, the problem, but not thinking upstream you know mm, um, mm, more and preventative and, yeah. and you obviously got to have you've got to have emergency departments and, and hospital beds as the last resort and there's got to be enough of them too not it's not an either or but the thing we're not doing is this missing middle you know the, the other steps in the in the, in the in the ladder yeah speaking of that and alternative services there are a couple of people isabella and also graham on facebook who were um wanted to ask about peer support that someone said why do you think peer support has been so slow to develop in Australia mm. compared to other Commonwealth com countries? Mm. Well, I think that the peer support is obviously a really positive development and mm. we, we're doing that and obviously we involve young people a lot, like you said. We want to do more of that. It's got a, a very vital role to play, but I think in some other countries they've seen it as an alternative you know, mm. to investing in expertise you know, amongst clinicians as well. So. To me, they're, they're, like, they're complementary things. And even what's happened more recently with the Beyond Blue program called The Way Back, you know, which is really like volunteers or, or, or peers supporting people who are kicked out of emergency departments or hospitals oh, wow. um, in that very vulnerable period after that, mm. that discharge and to help save the lives of those, you know, because it's a very high risk period for suicide. Yeah. Well, that's great. You know, that, that's a really great thing to do. It obviously works. And the government's put a lot of money, you know, $37 million into spreading that. But that also lets the government off the hook um, in terms of investing in um, the professionals that are needed, the expertise to also help people in those situations. And, you know, um, those services, health services, both uh, state and federal, have got a responsibility to, to look after, you know, the, um, the clinical expertise aspect of that too. So... Again, it's not an either or. The, both of those things combined probably would be incredibly effective, but mm. you, you can't just do one or the other. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting because I know that um, Headspace have done a bit more peer support um, in clinical services, mm -hmm. and also there's a bit of it at Origin as well. Yeah, I mean we we, we see it as a, as a as a like a an additional you know strengthening thing you know. And, and also, like I said, if we if we didn't listen to the young people, we wouldn't have had the right culture either. So, so definitely, the, and and if you if I think people also <coughs> um, 
should expect more from the clinicians. You know, it's, 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 huh. it's, it really is a vocation. You know, working it's a privilege to be able to work with people with mental illness, and it's not just your convenience and your lifestyle that you need to think about. You need to think about um, the vocational aspect of it from the clinician's point of view. And so, clinicians need to work in much more flexible, you know, um, client-focused ways. I think than they mm. currently do. You know, a lot of the a lot of the work practice of clinicians needs reform too. Yeah, that's interesting because we've got a question here from Christine on Facebook and she asked, what do you feel future clinicians need to be trained in given yeah. the constantly changing world of mental health? Yeah, well, that's, that's another great question. Well, when I, when I was trained, you know, I, I was taught about adolescence based on the theories of Anna Freud from the 1930s. You mm. know? So it was already out of date by the time I was, uh, well, I didn't train in the 1930s, by the way, but, <laughs> but, but it was already out of date when I was trained. But even now, you know, the, the latest understanding of, of the current generations of young people is not actually part of the training of mental health professionals. So, so they don't really understand, you know, what the, what the, what the differences are between a young person growing up in, mm. you know, 2018 compared to 1968, let's say, you know. That, so that's the one thing, the developmental understanding and, and the sort of... And, um, and there's, a big, there's a big difference. There's a huge difference, like. yeah. Um, and, that, and I can remember 1968, so I can, I can, tell, I can see the difference and feel the difference. And, so, so that's one aspect, but also I suppose, um, you know, there have got to be new ways of working. Like just because just CBT is evidence-based doesn't mean it's going to appeal to everybody. Mm. And, and we've got to use the things that work and, and modernise them, perhaps using technologies like online mm. you know, platforms, but also virtual reality and things to make these, these therapies work more, more effectively. And mm. I think, you know, so... You know that dynamic sort of um, what's the word innovation you know, mm. in, in in therapy and training um, and also supporting the workforces as well in the job because it is a hard job too to be fair to the clinicians for, for once you know I suppose oh, you've yeah. got to really sort of say you know when you're dealing with distressed angry people a lot of the time that's tough you know and, and you need to be a very special type of person and you need to be supported in that work too yeah yeah. It's interesting you're talking about inner innovation. Um, we have a question from Rian who is asking, do you think that mental health services are innovative enough? I feel like I know what you're <laughs> going to say. <laughs> and, but do you feel like there's enough scope to try new approaches? Or, or how do you think that we can foster new approaches? Is it through research? Well, I mean, all the reforms that we, we've um, been able to sort of drive and, and in partnership with people in other countries and have all been driven through the fact that we are, we are a, a mix of a research centre mm. and, and a clinical service. Um, if you were just a pure research centre, you wouldn't be able to, to do that, that, that task. And if you were just a straight clinical service, you'd, you'd tend to get very institutionalised pretty quickly and, and anti-innovative, I'd say, just shoring up what you always done, have done. Yeah. So um, I think you've got to have a research culture embedded within the mental health service. And in mental health, you know, unlike in cancer and heart disease, Research is often suspected as being a bit dubious, you know, in some mm. way. You know, uh, um, I've worked with a lot of clinicians who some, somehow feel research is burdening the, the patients. You know. mm. It's the opposite. If, if research is happening in, in the clinical service, the patients do a lot better. Because oh, really? Yeah, they, they really do. Because first of all, you attract more enthusiastic, curious people into the mix. Um, there's a more commitment as to... As in, as clinicians? Yeah, or both. Yeah, right. Both. And... and, and um, and, and also, you, you, you're committed to learning and improving quite often too. And so I think that, that kind of innovation culture that, that, um, which is driven by research is, is, is really, we wouldn't have done anything without that. Mm. Is, is, I was wondering if uh, the IPS program is an example of that, is a good example of that? Yeah. Can you just first explain what that yeah. is? Um, well, IPS is, is called Individual Placement and Support. And the basic idea is that now, when I was first trained, I mean, when people had a breakdown of some sort, like a psychotic episode, everyone said, oh, you know, don't get, don't stress yourself, you know, take a mm. year off from uni or, you know, don't go back to work too soon, you know, um, wait until you're really well and then we'll help you to, you know, like rehab type mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the evidence has shown from research that it's the opposite. If you put a, a vocational expert into a clinical service alongside the clinicians and you aim to get the person back to school straight away or, or, or work straight away or even stop them dropping out in the first place, the outcomes are so much better in terms of you know, yeah. uh, vocational recovery and sustaining that too. 
So it's the opposite of what people sort of, from common sense point of view, thought. Yeah. So the research really showed that that wasn't true, and and now people are doing it that way. You know, more yeah, and more. yeah. Mm. That brings me to a to a question I wanted to ask you around. I feel like there's a new conversation happening around how context plays into our well being. I feel like IPS is a great example of how actually um you know staying in work or staying in um Mm. schooling is really beneficial to your well-being so Mm. um encouraging people to stay in those parts of their lives is is useful to the Mm -hmm. recovery process um i don't know if you know johan hari's book lost connections um but he talks about how there's Mm. he talks about how there's dying causes of anxiety and depression that two of them are biological or um, genetic or brain chemistry based. Mm. And that the other ones are, the other seven are to do with um, lost connections to different things in our lives, like connection to the secure future, meaningful work, natural world Mm. and community. I was wondering like, what do you think of that kind of research? And what do you think that that means for the future of mental health? Well, I'm glad you brought that up Mm. because I actually, did a, a, um, a panel discussion with him on, on, on the drum on ABC. Oh, right, um, cool. About two weeks ago. And I had, had done a previous one with him on Radio National. And, and he was expecting me to be kind of critical of him because he was sort of started off by saying, well, psychiatry isn't all about, isn't all about medications and stuff. And of course, and, and, you know, but actually I completely agreed with him because um, when, when I was trained and when psychiatrists are trained, they're trained in a much more holistic way than any other doctors, you know, mm. to look at all these other factors that you just mentioned, like, you know, the um, the psychology of people, the social world, and all the things he highlighted, and things you just mentioned, you know, ev- even just if you think about it from your own point of view for a minute, all those things, you know they're important, like connection with the national, n- natural world, mm. relationships with people, you know, not being um, sort of in, imprisoned by loneliness, and you know, mm. all these things mm. are incredibly important to people's mental health and well-being, and if those things are not there, it's very hard to be mentally healthy, isn't it? And so that they're relevant to people with and without mental illnesses, actually, all of those things. And, and, and uh, so he's, he's, he's completely right. And, and uh, we found ourselves agreeing about all these things. And, and, and the fact that, you know, I suppose in, in, in clinical services, they, they've, they don't give enough weight to these things, you know, mm. even though they were trained to believe that, that they're very important. So that's partly because of the underfunding and the financial constraints and, and limitations of the, of the, of the thinking. You know? And you, you hear people bagging the, the medical model or the clinical approach, you know. I mean, it's not an either or, you, you, you can have both, you know, you can have that kind of expertise around <coughs> treatment and then you have all these other social interventions and, and social considerations which need support as well. And, and um, I suppose that's where the peer support comes in a bit too. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see it as being that way, particularly with peer support, um, because uh, going through that breakdown or whatever it is that you call it can be a really lonely, isolating experience. It can really significantly mm. change your life and yeah. your connection to a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I feel like peer support is a like very particular initiative or intervention that mm-hmm. um, that. Tr- that does address some of the, yeah. like, more specifically, some of those more holistic things, yeah. But things like, um, you know, I work in the, in the headspace up in Coffs Harbour, and there's a, there's, a, there's a mental health nurse there who will take the, the young people whale watching, for example, you know, <laughs> um, as a group, you know, uh, or surfing, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, when I, was, I visited, I think, Headspace on the Gold Coast, and they do yeah. surf classes. Yeah, surf therapy, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's connection with the natural environment. Yeah. Like, it's not for everyone. There might be a, you know, maybe going for a walk in a forest would be better for other people, but that's like a way of improving the person's mental state. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm really interested in what you're saying about the the like blending the clinical and kind of ho- holistic or well-being sort of models, mm. and um, I noticed because uh, Sarah Wilson, who's an Australian author. She brought out a book last year about anxiety called First We Make the Beast Beautiful. Mm. And um, she kind of kind of says that we need to look at anxiety in a new way. It's kind of mm. the thesis of the book. You're quoted in the front. Mm. Um, 
I did read the. I did read the book. It <laughs> no, 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 no. It was an amazing book. From your from from your quote, you obviously had read the book, and it, it is a really amazing book. Um, and you said that um, Sarah's narrative shows why the conventional diagnostic framework doesn't really work. And I I was really struck by that. I was like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, she, she kind of talks about it in like in a in a in a very um, I don't know. Um, Creative way, you know, mm. if I put it that way. But, but we 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 agree that it doesn't really work. Um, like the DSM and, and, and the, the things that we we were kind of forced to work with, you know, in our research, you know, all these diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia or bipolar or whatever. Um, now these are a hundred years old. These ideas and, and and they haven't really helped us to sort of understand the the underlying basis of these illnesses that well, and they haven't really guided treatment very well. So there's not the utility of the diagnosis is not great, you know. mm. um, and and you know obviously the people who are suffering from these illnesses have not read the textbooks properly because they they've got symptoms from all different categories <laughs> and quite often. So so it's it doesn't it do, it's not as neat as the book as leads neat, you to no. believe. Yeah, and it's just very descriptive, and and it's, and the descriptions are, are kind of partly wrong. They're not completely wrong, but they mm. they don't really help. So we, what we've been working on is addressing Sarah's point, trying to create a more usable diagnostic approach and we mm. call it staging you try to fit them into anxiety or depression or you know schizophrenia they don't really fit but they, but um they've got bits and, and over time that might become a bit clearer it might fit the might fit the pattern of schizophrenia mm. or might fit the pattern but at the point they first need help those distinctions are not really helpful and, mm. and, and so we luckily our treatments are not specific to those dsm diagnoses anyway i mean you know, our, our psychosocial treatments like CBT or, you know, all the things we've just been talking about, the holistic treatments, that they would be helpful to everybody, you know, yeah. in, in the early stages. You know. And even the drug treatments, even the, the, the government um, forces us to license them according to particular diagnostic categories like schizophrenia or, or psychosis or mania or bipolar, um, they actually have a broader spectrum of action, you know. So yeah. it's something that we call an antidepressant actually is really good for anxiety a lot of the time, perhaps even better than it is for depression. So th- they've got a broader spectrum of action than what they're labelled as. You know? yeah. so, so we're trying to shake it up a bit and work out what's the right treatment for the right person and, and the, the right stage of illness. And obviously we want to you know, not use drug therapies prematurely before people really need them or could benefit from them. But um, so sta- a staging approach to diagnosis is important and then working out what are the useful categories. You know, mm. that, that and, and sometimes people like to have a label because it ma- means that they, their problem's recognised and mm. that, you know, they're not the first person to have this problem. There's lots of other people affected by it. So, so diagnosis can be helpful to people in a comforting sort of way, but it's got to be useful. Yeah, I mean, people can have so, so many different um, mm. reactions to yeah. that, like uh, different ways of seeing what they're going through. Yeah. And I think that what's interesting is... is um, we try, like, you know, we're trying to make stuff really, like, black and white, yeah. but actually the it's reality is... It's a bit more dimensional, isn't it? Yeah. It's a bit more fluid. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more fluid and grey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, th- I think also we've still got labels in psychiatry that are, that are kind of stigmatising or harmful. Mm. And I'd, I'd say schizophrenia was one of those because it had so much pessimism attached to it. Mm. That, you know, I was told when I first started training in psychiatry that you know, and patients would be told that you've got schizophrenia, you're never going to get better, you know, your hope would be stripped away in the first interview, you know, with the person and just an incredibly irresponsible thing to do and yeah. really horrible. They, you don't even do that to people with advanced cancer, you, you always offer hope and, and, and comfort. And um, so schizophrenia was a problem. Um, it just turned out that it's not true, that, 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 that um, it's, it's um, always a de- deteriorating illness, There's a, uh, the outcomes are much better if, you, if they're properly treated. Um, and the other one that I, I really have an issue with is borderline, the borderline mm. personality, because that is so stigmatised even among mental and mental health professionals. Mm. And, and, you know, colleagues here, Andrew Channer and his team have been trying to sort of change the perception of borderline too. Mm. But that's a very tough ask because even the professionals, you know, um, um, have got a very negative attitude yeah. towards, towards it. So. I think we, we've got to kind of um, re-engineer, re- reimagine it, and, and, and maybe maybe you keep the name. I don't know, but th- these are some of the problems with some of our diagnostic terms. 
Yeah, particularly from the inside. You know, I've, I've particularly around um, borderline, I've looked at research mm-hmm. which shows that you know people can have more negative uh, uh, thoughts around people's outcomes based on the label alone yeah. rather than what's That's going right. on for the person. Yeah, if you if you'd never heard of it, and you wouldn't mm. immediately assume such negative things, and yeah. And so th- I think that is a problem, and whether it can be salvaged or not, uh, that's a debate. You know, the other thing I, I have got an issue with is the whole concept of personality disorders, actually, mm. because it's a very negative thing to say about someone that they've got <laughs> a disordered personality. Yeah, it's, um, it's not very positive to No, I mean, it's very judgmental I- implicitly, mm. and, 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 and we don't want to think that way about people with borderline personality mm. because that doesn't, they're not responsible for the problem. Um, um, and we have to think about them as people who deserve the same sort of care as everybody else. There might be other personality disorders like antisocial where there's an overlap with criminality where judgment comes much more to the fore. So anyway, these are, these are the sort of debates that we have. Yeah, 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 yeah. It gets, it gets like quite philosophical. Yeah, it when, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you get down to it. We're going to wrap up soon, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about something that you mentioned before, which is hope. And I, it's been 25 years. I was curious. Mm. Do you think that the role of hope is different in the system now? Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot more hope than there was before. Um, that's a really great point that you brought up. Um, but, you know, especially where I started off working in schizophrenia and psychosis, mm. there, was, there was so little hope. And, and you, you, people like, like me and my, my friends and colleagues that were trying to change that were rubbished a lot. You know, we, they told us, what are you doing? You, 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 you're giving people false hope. You, you, you're, you're being unrealistic. You've got rescue fantasies. It was another oh, term. Oh, wow. Even that, that's what they would say. And, and n- not that you, um, yeah, and, uh, and I guess contrast it with, with uh, other areas of, of medicine where hope is valued, you know, and mm. there are even editorials in The Lancet and British Medical Journal about the value of hope and optimism. And even when we started to show good results from early intervention programs in psychosis, people would say, oh, well, that's just because of enthusiasm. That's just because you're kind of, you know, uh, got energy and you're enthusiastic. The treatments aren't really working. It's just it's just a bit of a mirage. It's a bit of mm. a placebo effect, you know, as though it wasn't a value to have you know energy and commitment and ho- and hope for the oh, patients. And wow. I mean, that's the sort of nonsense that get, was well, being dealt with at that time. Yeah. But I think that's changed now. I don't think people would be able to get away with that kind of negativity. Yeah, and there's also like particularly even in the physical health realm. I think it's hearts for healthcare. Mm-hmm. There's that researcher looking at um, how empathy plays a role in the recovery of patients in a physical health setting. Yeah. And now, like, because of the research and um, the uh, the better recovery that people have when they have empathic um, healthcare workers, mm. um, he he now does training like in, in empathy for for mm. health professionals, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and I think you know to, to to sort of explain why the clinicians were were, were like that because they because they were always looking after the the, the people who hadn't got better they had mm. something what was called the clinician's illusion so they thought everyone was going to do badly because they were the only people they ever saw yeah of course so, so it's kind of it was it wasn't really their fault that they thought that way and, mm. and, and the way the way psychiatry was treated in the health system and still is with this neglect like they were being being given being given the message that that these people don't count as much. You know. mm. That's the thing we really object to and why here at Origin with our 25th anniversary we're about to get a new facility which has been funded by the government. It's going to be a real statement about the value of, of, of what we're doing um, and the value of, of, of the young people and their problems and to, to society. So that meta level of, of message of you are important, you really do matter mm. is, is incredibly important and, and we believe you can get better. So. You know, it, it might seem soft to some people that it's not like a drug or a, or a, a, a biopsy or something, but it, it's incredibly important to people's recovery. Yeah, that's a really good point that it's so important, the value of hope in the work mm. that we do. Yeah, H- hope, personal support, like you were saying about peer support, but, but expertise, you know, like mm. to, to be a really good mental health professional, you've got to have an affinity for it with the work, but you've got to go through many years of training I think mm. because it's it's not um, as simple as it might sound it's not it's not always common sense and there are there are a lot of things to be learned and respect for the training and the, and the 
expertise of clinicians was really important too. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to end with a question uh, from Rian, which is a blue sky question. So Rian on Facebook asks, if you had all the money in the world, this blank check, you can put whatever you want on it. Mm-hmm. Um, how would the system be different for young people? Hmm, well, hmm. I've thought about this because we're always asking the government to invest more money. Mm. So, so I think the, the, the really urgent thing is, is to fix this missing middle problem. So, you know, basically building on our foundations with Headspace so that, so if you, if you actually are, uh, are able to access care through a Headspace centre, that through that channel, through that, that portal or that door, you can access everything that you need, you know, for as long as you need it. Mm. Um, and that'd be a real change. That'd be, mass- <laughs> that'd be massive, and 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 it, it, and it wouldn't break the bank, you know. But but I think you would have to. Sub- you you you'd really. It, it's a several hundred million dollar proposition a year. Yeah. That one, um, and then I think fixing the, the bottom end of the system too. We, we've got to make the inpatient units much more humane, compassionate, and therapeutic, and support the staff to to realize their vocations and they're not being properly supported the staff at the moment mm. to do that um so th- those are the like the service type things and then the, what you were talking about before really understanding you know with the with the help of young people through qualitative research what is actually what are the what are the risk factors what are the things affecting the mental health of young people what, what mm. in a preventive sense what can we do to to reduce the the flow you know in, into the sy- system so the system yeah. is, isn't as isn't as um, um, needed as, as it currently is. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Turning off the tap. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. It makes me think of the work from the Foundation for Young Australians who mm-hmm. do a lot of work around advocating for young people and yeah. issues like that. And I think giving young people much more of a say in all these things yeah. too is really important because, you know, assuming that we know all the answers, you know, um, obviously research going to help us get answers too but it's got to be a partnership and the, you know our generations the older generations have got to show a lot more respect and care for young people like, you know coming back to what I said about the neglect of young people mm. and, and um, young people have got to then take on a leadership role too and, and they, they can fight to get that as well as being supported to get it you know you, you can't always you can't always get it without a fight <laughs> <laughs> sometimes a fight is part of the process totally, yeah. <laughs> Um, and on that note, I think that we'll finish up there. Thanks very much, yeah, thank Pat. You, it's been great chatting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs>